So everybody, I'm going to be much uh, sh shorter than, uh, much briefer than out of ties on the schedule. So for those of you who have limited bladders, help is at hand. But I do have to I get us to uh, the slide deck. <laughs> so I'm speaking now uh, on behalf of the board of the uh, I2B2 Transmark Foundation. Um, and what you will hear me talk about is deliberations that were at, done at the board and, and with a lot of uh, input from membership. So it's very uh, comforting to be able to make these points in the context of what you've already heard this morning. It's going to become even more compelling in hindsight when you're done with tomorrow because you'll see how fast we're moving and how much we're empowering you. More than ever before, not only are we giving you the access to the tools, we're giving you the ability, what are you doing? We're giving you the ability to actually contribute to the code base, help us debug, move things forward. And so I would say that by virtue of this foundation having come together, we are going to be focusing I think much more than in the past. Although I think we did a great job, we're gonna do a quantum leap in developing a uh, community through membership programs, through working groups, through training programs, as you'll see tomorrow, and through community meetings. We've already heard about the wonderful full European meeting in Geneva, which I have yet to be invited to. Uh, you've also um, heard about the new I2B2 uh, Transmart uh, public release. But we need your help at this point. And I'm about to ask for your help. And I want you to put it in, in context. The smallest enterprise software that you use in your institutions, five, ten, $20,000, I'm not even talking about add-ons to Epic or to Cerner, which costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. But this is an organization that runs an extremely lean ship. I have to tell you that as we brought together these two foundations, we've changed our model. Previously, there was a lot of funding from the pharmaceutical uh, industry, and that was great. Um, but it's not the way we're going to move in the future. In the future, if this is going to be a grassroots community, which it always has been, the support will have to come from the grassroots. And what are we actually supporting? We are not supporting uh, tactical pants. We are not supporting, did anybody get that reference? No? Yes. One, one person read the news. What? $1,500 tactical pants. No. What we're supporting are these monthly community calls, monthly training programs, organization of the spring and fall conferences, oper operational support of the program management committees, maintaining the foundation website, and supporting the existing working groups. And I believe that we can get this done for an incredibly small budget, probably around $100,000 a year. I mean, certainly we could do more with more, but I think $100,000 a year is probably what will allow us to do these things. So what, how are we gonna get there? I'm gonna ask that you seriously consider yourself or going back to your home institutions and saying, we wanna become contributing members, not just members, but contributing members to the new foundation to help this grassroots organization, which gives so much functionality for free to the world. But I think it's often helpful to give some benefits to um, contributing members, sort of like a Kickstarter campaign. So what would you get as contributing uh, members? Well, for starters, two free tickets to each foundation 
event. As you notice, this event is free. Because I think it's important that we really be community supported, it will no longer be free. If you are a contributing member, you'll get two free tickets. You'll get quarterly updates on the developmental ro uh, development roadmaps, detailed updates, not just the informal updates that you're getting here, but full updates. You'll get access to early demonstrations, which I think, I at least when I've been a developer, that's, I found it extremely uh, important. And you'll have access to a high priority uh, Jira uh, ticket queue so that the things that you care more about will, will be on that high, higher priority queue. And finally, contributing members will be recognized on the foundation website. Now I wanna reflect when I was the age of some of the people in this group who are on the younger side, $5,000 sounded like a big amount of money, and it is. And not all of you will necessarily feel like that you have the clout to go to your organizations and ask for that amount. But I think you'd be surprised. I think if you go back to your teams, to your CIO or your CMO and say, this is value for our organization, much less than the cost of most institutional enterprise software, the vast majority, but it's giving us critical ability to move forward and we're getting privileged access to the development process and to the vision, I believe that you will find a willing audience. And for those who are younger, let me tell you, it'll be a developmental experience for you one way or the other. So at this point, and by the way, you'll have to forgive me because I am, because I do really passionately believe in our mission. And I passionately do believe that we need to get supported by the community. Uh, I will be coming back to this by email and other venues to this point several times because I'm very proud of what we've done as a community and therefore I, I am, in my opinion, appropriately shameless about seeking your support. So now, briefly, because again, your bladders like mine may be uh, reaching capacity, I'd like to encourage and open to a discussion. And so all of you should feel free to make comments now in person or by email later, but I'd encourage you now. What else do you think the foundation should be doing? What are the priorities that you see? What should we be doing to grow the community? And any feedback on what I just said? I tend to not to do want to talk about bullet number five because it's it's too easy to redirect and say, oh, these other people will give money. Let's worry about that some other time. So someone be brave and start the discussion. Go ahead. Seth here, do we exactly what the trajectories are for the I2B2 platform, the transpart platform, the I2B2 slash transpart uh, smart platforms? Can you kind of talk about it at that higher level? So, so I cannot talk about it in detail, but I can tell you, but some other people in this room can, but I can tell you the trajectories are actually a little different for those three different uh, uh, projects. Ultimately, they will be lockstep, but right now it's a work in progress. So from my perspective, what you see is you have a certain um, set of code representing 16.1 from Transmod, got updated, changed to work well with I2B2. That's gonna move up together on its own uh, on its path. I2B2 itself will have its own uh, roadmap. As far as I can tell, it's going to continue uh, being, going forward, being quite compatible with that uh, forward-looking uh, roadmap. 
I think that there are a few forks in the Transmart path, and I'll let Paul give his opinion how that's going to work. Interesting, that's the key question. On the uh, today, because that's why I started to explain the, the, uh, the history so that everybody is updated on what happened. Why are we too late? It's explaining a part of the piece of something that the way you were so, the, uh, well, the I2B2, there's an I2B2 community using I2B2 today in production in their environment. There's our transfer community using their system in their environment. And so what we wanted to do is to be as less disruptive as possible in, for example, what we created, because I2B2 and Transmart have their own roadmap of like where they wanted to go with the different stakeholders and all that. But it was, uh, it didn't make any sense to have them separated. So what we wanted to do is to make sure that you have the I2B2, for example, the I2B2 Transmart 18.1 that you can now access and download is using now the latest I2B2 installation, meaning that you can install I2B2 Transmart on top of your I2B2 <coughs> database. So that's the key point where we really wanted to make sure that they can be, because yes, it's a set of tools, but not everyone here has the same usage of it. And I doubt that there are two individuals here using it the same way. Some people will just want the user interface. Some people will just hate any of the user interface where they want direct interface to the database. So there's a whole spectrum of users. So it was just a question of there's the HP roadmap, and Sean will talk about it. There's the transmart roadmap, and Rudy can talk about it. There will be the two uh, uh, HP2 and transmart PNC chairs. Uh, but what we wanted to do is because it didn't make any sense to have them separated. So that's why we created this new joint between them. So does it mean that one of them will disappear? Uh, no, it means that there's just different community based on different needs based on different studies. And so then, then also a, a key element is Transmart uh, has also an, uh, potentially a new release potential, which is not in production, the 17.1. The 17.1 of Transmart is not finished. And because it's not finished, it's not in production, it's not being used. So that's why we do not want to use this not finished version. We prefer to use one that was actually working, that we were all using, that was developed, so that we could build on uh, uh, solid uh, ground before creating a job. So that's the reason why there's, you can see different versions. Uh, but the, it's because there's so many, I think the real reason is there's so many different users and so many different use cases that there's not one system that meets all the needs. It's really a, a question of depending what you want to do. Yeah, so I think the question is, um, how is the community actually coming together and these three, what you might think are separate projects coming together in order to take advantage of each other, right? And so I think that um, each one currently kind of has its own um, emphasis and the emphases are not, um, are complementary. So I2B2 is very focused um, on getting the data in, right, and being able to take advantage of various kinds of data sources. So we've been working on this idea of query endpoints, which you'll see it for, where we can have a query endpoint that is an I2B2 database, but it can also be an OMOP database. It can even be a fire database, right? So there's different endpoints that they can query from, ultimately converging the data into the environment that Paul's describing. And the way that we're much, that, 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 that this environment that Paul's created with um, I2B2 Transmart is a data science environment that's open and gives us the opportunity now to put together projects very much like was suggested in terms of, you know, have a GitHub full of projects which take advantage of the environment of uh, I2B2 Transmart, and each person can work on those. 
And then there's an outpouring, right? So coming out of that environment, what does that leverage? So it leverages the fact that we have fire and that we can uh, present the results of data science into clinical care through our fire I2B2 interfaces. And then we can also uh, put them out as um, portals, right? So things that use the um, structured data can now be queried and, and, and downloaded by, by your people, right? Your researchers and scientists and clinicians who you're supporting at your hospitals. So I think that there's a full path here, which goes from I2B2 traditionally worried about uh, data sources, how to get new data sources kind of you know, situated away, connecting to those, those data sources, getting the data into the environment that Paul describes, and then allowing that data to flow out into your researchers in various ways. And then there's the environment itself, which Paul has been developing, which actually leverages now all new kinds of data science tools and different ways of connecting to other kinds of data sources. And then there's Transmart, which allows the actual things like fractals and so forth to be developed and integrated into the environment. And traditionally it was a place where we could actually have this kind of middle ground of places where tools can live and be leveraged. And there's new interfaces coming out with that and so forth too. So this will be discussed at eight o'clock tomorrow morning, by the way, in our 8.30, okay, 8.30 tomorrow morning at Calway in the Leahy room. Leahy room. So, um, that there'll be much more open discussion than about this. Yeah, and I did hear from the trans I just wanted to add that, you know, I think our plan was to have this discussion at the, the session tomorrow where we'll talk about, you know, uh, directions and, and, you know, future plans and things. But, you know, from the, you know, my perspective with Transmar and, and the foundation, you know, we're the caretakers of a, a couple of very important platforms to the community, but it's the community's um, tools. You know, these are developed open source, they're developed, you know, for you and, and largely by you. Uh, and, you know, our, our goal is to really try to understand and help, you know, foster your continuing use and development of these platforms. And that's, that's what we're really trying to do. So um, as we talk about the directions and the roadmaps, let's get together tomorrow morning at 8.30. The three of us will be there, a lot of other the folks who are involved. And I think that'd be a great time for us to really, you know, drill down into kind of where we're going, what our directions are, and really hear from you. Where would you like to see us go? Because in the end, that's what really drives these platforms. So if there's, I don't know if there's any other discussion, maybe we just wrap it up here and, you know, we'll have the discussions. Another question? Yeah. In addition to the PMC, so variety of interfaces, that's analysis that's right. tools, mm -hmm. federated networks, sure. other things. What I see as part of the challenge is figuring out what the scope is of it. What, what, what is part of what we're doing, what's outside of that. It used to be 10 years ago very straightforward. I2B2, there was a hive, and if you shared the same I2B2 API, it all plugged in, it was very clear what it is. Now it's a lot harder to understand what the common thing is. Picture API, is it being installed in Docker? Is it I2B2? Data model. I think we have to figure out um, what it means that could be I think that's a fair point, absolutely. <clears throat> Another question there. Thanks, Griffin. And for those who don't know, it's Griffin who created the first user interface of that And so the uh, one And you would know you created the first user interface, the web interface, yeah. <laughs> and the uh, so the uh, and that's a, a, a key question of how can all the uh, components can fit together. And if it, this is different here, yeah, I'm not finished because you all have tools in your research environment, you all have other tools, and you want to be thinking about. See how these can, can go and work together. And so that, that's why we architect this integration of HP Cosmo using an API, the picture API, as being the backbone to enable to make this interaction. So that's what we described in the uh, in the roadmap for the HP Cosmo integration. Because it's uh, 
should be able to make sure that you can definitely change and I showed you three different user interfaces uh, using the picture API as the underlying layer, but dep depending on, on the use cases that you have, where you can create many different user interfaces on top of it. So using the picture API is the way we've been doing this in the context of the IT to transmart uh, into the transmart. I think there's also an underlying point that's worth making is that the amount of money that Zach suggested would be necessary to keep the foundation going is really infrastructure. It's it's administrative oversight, it's organizing events, et cetera. And I think at some level the question was, you know, where is the funding coming from to advance the three the three profiles and how how's that being driven? And so to date, largely that has been coming from the individual leads or members with grants to them or to their groups, basically pushing the frontier forward and then being able to share it with the community, just as we did with like to be two components for NIH. So, you know, be aware that that model will, with the, the sort of de minimis contribution to the foundation, will have to continue that way. Either your individual grants where you do something that you're willing to share back, where the innovators are continuing with their success in, in finding external funding to do that. Yeah, another question. Yeah. Yeah. So, what you get for your 5K? That was, um, I really appreciate that. That was, uh, it was kind of like, I didn't have to worry about it, though, and a really good list came out. Um, but that second to last one, Great, I get to put in a high priority ticket because then, and then there's somebody going to work on it. That's, that's kind of what she was saying. You know, where's the, this funding come from? So I think that's an interesting challenge going forward. But, but in, in any case, this list, I think, uh, can do a lot worse than that. Yeah, I, I saw that one as a particularly interesting one. Um, I mean, the bottom line is, though, that what Suzanne says is true, right? So um, we have to get grant funding for specific projects. There's not like an open I2B2 Transmart fund that we can then pull from, you know, and say, oh, we're going to try this, right? There just isn't. And so the the money that Zach's talking about here is small money. It's really just like Suzanne said, it's just to organize the meetings, right? Just to organize the communication. As you all know, you know, to actually do stuff like, you know, I2B2 Transmart and I2B2 and Transmart is millions of dollars, millions. And so unless we have um, things at that scale, we really can't think about, you know, doing something totally new, which isn't grant funded, which doesn't fit into like some kind of grant funding that we're able to. So that's a very good question about that item. Um, and. Um, I, I think what it means is that um, if it's a really bad bug, we'll try to get to it right away. <laughs> well, there's also the, the PMCs to talk through. So. That's right. You want to say something? Uh, one um, how many people here are familiar with the Apache Software Foundation? They have 350 projects with annual budget of $700,000. Okay. How much money goes into every Apache project? It's all individual developers that are contributed by their corporations or by the universities or by other projects. And this foundation is, is working the same way. It has three projects right now. So proportionally, 100000 to support three is, is not a bad return. But it will grow as, as people continue to community. So I think it's something very good to jump into and work with, but understand that every project has a funding of the individuals that are doing it. And the other important thing is if you want to have a say in the roadmaps and the development, get involved. You know, go in and, and contribute a developer to the PNC. And if they're writing code and they're at the table, they'll have a say in what's happening. And I think that's the way to, to really do it, is to get involved, get engaged, and work together. So I have a practical question yeah. for Suzanne and Diane. Would you, uh, what are the what constitutes a member? Is this for individual membership, a laboratory membership, institutional member, um, and is it a 501c3 contribution? 
So, I mean, we believe it's a 501c3 contribution. Um, our, our thinking was that it's, it's at, you know, it, it could be an institution level or it could be a group level, depending on the, in the, the, you know, how the money is, is brought together. Um, we had, you know, we weren't specific about, you know, what that needed to be. I don't want to create a draw when if you're making an individual contribution, it's tax deductible. Oh, it's the yeah. it And then the lab could include yeah. only one person. Right. Of course, institution is probably too big yeah. size. I don't know. It depends where you are. If I recall the bylaws correctly, um, members are individuals at this point, right? Yeah. So corporations and labs and but you certainly can create a class of membership right. or a sponsor. That, that's what we're talking about is a contributing member as a new class, a new class of membership. Right. Okay. And, and, and something that wasn't mentioned for, uh, very quickly is the fact that you can use this in your class. You can write this. You can get a new tool of support from the foundation if in the application process you're explaining that you want to use the, those tools, then you'll get an official letter of support by, uh, by the CEO yeah. of the foundation right. explaining that there's a whole community helping us so that you don't have to start from scratch in order to uh, build yet another software. So it's really a question of the foundation is also here to help you uh, to get this funding. And that's definitely help as a reviewer. You'll see that if someone says that you want to create Today, a new data warehouse to integrate clinical and genomic data from scratch, that's a lot of work. If someone says that they're using some other system, yes, but if they have the support of the foundation, that definitely helps in the context of being credible to the reviewers if they have the, uh, there's different members and the different applicants are already interacting and uh, based on the experience of uh, using those open source tools. I'm happy to be the first contributing member of the opportunity is still available. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gil, and let's hear it for you, Michigan. Yeah. Okay, anyone, any other question or comments?